Well, jumping in, I'll skip my normal intro, um, but we preach text by text through books of the Bible. That's all you've got to really know here. Our aim is to preach the word in season and out of season, and here we are in the book of Esther trying to do precisely that, and uh, God has continued to bless a pitiful man like me to feed you and grow me in that ability, Lord willing, indefinitely, because I have a long way to go, but continue to seek to be fed by his word and his word alone. We know from Esther at this point that darkness has covered the land. The edict that all the Jews must be killed has been agreed upon by the king and Haman the Agagite, his evil second-in-command over the entire Persian Empire. Like many horrifying edicts that beget death, that bring about death, there was much deception prior to the deadly edict, much monetary bribing. This deadly law stems from the same roots that all deadly laws come from. Like the silver that bribed Judas Iscariot into betraying Jesus the Christ, so here silver bribes King Ahasuerus into betraying the people of God. Proverbs says, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household. But he who hates bribes will live. And we will see the truth of that, not in our text today, but in the text to come in the story of Esther. The king does not summon his counselors when talking to Haman and receiving this pitch. He doesn't take the pitch and then reach out to his counselors like he has historically done at this point. He doesn't reach out to his lawyers or his wife to decide the fate of an entire people. The money was all the counsel he needed. It was the God he worshipped, and he would gladly kill to worship this God. He summons only his scribes, not for counsel, but just to craft the edict, to get it out speedily to all the citizens of the Persian Empire. Notice first that the edict goes out 11 months prior to the date of its effect, the date when the slaughter must take place. Now, we'll talk more about the date that it was sent out in a little while. But the edict going out 11 months prior to the date of the actual effect is likely just because Haman wanted to cause utter depression, anxiety, chaos, sadness in the people of God, and to an extent, all the people, because he hates everyone under him. Notice also that the edict goes to the entire empire. It goes first to the king's satraps, governors, and the officials over each province. But it also goes to every province in its own script and every people group in their own language. Why? Because this edict, this new law, is for everyone. It's for everyone. Not just everyone to learn about, but everyone to partake in. It was written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring, says verse 12. This edict is for everyone. Everyone in the empire must bow and obey the king's edict. What was perhaps at one time unthinkable among the people of the empire, it would never get that bad, I'm sure they thought, is now law. Not just for the officials or the governors or the king's satraps, but for everyone. They must all obey the edict. And what was the edict exactly? That if you were a Persian under the empire, even if you were once another nation and now have been taken over by the Persian empire, much of the world was at this time, what was the edict that you must obey on this particular day? Verse 13. Destroy. Kill. Annihilate. All Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. This was the edict handed out to all the Persians. Let me read it once again, just that we, we might possibly feel the weight of it. Destroy, kill, and annihilate all Jews, 
young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. We mustn't be surprised when sin begets death, church. An empire built on sinful foundations will eventually beget death. God's word is true. The true liberal ethics have an illusion of being for everyone. A true libertarian, even in our day, would say, really, we just maximize freedom at all costs. That's their end goal. But they're failing to recognize that freedom necessarily has boundaries. It necessarily has boundaries. True liberal ethics have an illusion of being for everyone, tolerant of all, maximizing freedom. But in reality, liberalism to the furthest extent, without the foundation of Christianity, will always beget death. It's intolerant hostilely intolerant towards certain people, and it will kill, if necessary, to maintain its love of sin. This edict to kill, destroy, and annihilate the Jews might appear as a radical turn of events for the citizens of the empire. The empire was rather peaceful at this point. We just got finished. It was a few years back at this point in the text. More years have elapsed than you might realize just by chapter 3 here since chapter 1, but it was just a few years back that the whole empire was partying together in the Susa, the capital city. The empire was rather peaceful up to this point, not in chaos, at least not superficially, at least not from what it appeared on your average day. But was the writing really not on the wall? When divorce is seen as the righteous thing to do because your wife simply says no to one request of yours, when six-month drunken parties seem like a good idea, when insatiable global conquest with the sword is already the norm, when sex slavery in the king's own palace is seemingly acceptable to the whole empire per their silence, is it really all that surprising that the same leader has an official who also wants genocide? And the main leader is at best indifferent to the idea and at worst also loves it. This is what happens when sin goes unbridled. When pulpits stop preaching the law and the gospel of God. When they stop preaching of the true king over all earthly kings. How do we expect kings and earthly rulers to live wisely, which requires, we know from the Proverbs, a fear of God if we stop preaching and proclaiming the truth? Who else is going to preach to them? Well, they just wake up and while they're eating their Wheaties think, I should fear God today. Most well, certainly not. We see it even in our founding documents in this country that there was a fear of God. There was a fear of God, which is why our documents are quite good. But this is what happens when God's people live in sin for generations without repentance, when mercy goes unappreciated. We have seen in Esther thus far and in Malachi at Bible study, which we're, we do every other Wednesday, Malachi is taking place around the same time, but in a different place. Still in the Persian Empire, but it's in Jerusalem. It's in the Promised Land, and Esther's taking place in the capital city of the Persian Empire. Both are under the Persian rule, but one's in the capital city, the other one's in the holy city, Jerusalem. And we've seen in Malachi that the worship of people of God, the people of God at this point in history, had become mere tradition. It had gone soft. But make no mistake, the worshipers of the devil had maintained their zeal. They persevered in their zeal. Their wickedness grew and grew and grew. Their obedience to their father became fundamental to who they are. The edict at this point in the narrative has gone out for everyone. For decades at this point, the people of the empire have operated under the tolerated presupposition that as long as we pay our taxes and keep our mouth shut, we will be protected and cared for. The empire might kill, they might kill, those people might kill, but I won't dare speak out against it because I'm not having to kill. They're not forcing me to do this. They are allowing me to live a peaceful and quiet life, at least superficially. 
while the citizens of the empire who thought that way were dead wrong. Sin begets death. I'm not saying the response should have been bearing the sword against the empire, though that likely would have been a good response for the nations that were about to be taken over by the Persians. National self-defense would have been a worthy endeavor. We remember the Spartans for their fight till death against the Persians. Do you remember any other nations during the Persian Empire who were taken over? I do not. Yet beyond the question of nations defending themselves against another nation or empire, I'm really speaking to this, the people of the empire and specifically the men of the empire. The preachers and priests and prophets of the empire, the fathers, where were they? What did they think was going to happen to their children's children based on the root idolatry of the empire's leaders? They had a post-millennial hope in an evil human empire. They convince themselves that things will just get better. They'll work themselves out. They told themselves this likely over and over. At least it won't get worse. I don't need to speak up. I don't need to speak out. I don't need to put more skin in this game. And what happened? What have we learned so far in the narrative of Esther? Their sons were drafted to fight for the empire and became drunks in the king's palace. And their daughters were drafted for the lusts of the king and became slaves in the king's palace. Even then, it seems as though the noble men of the empire had become cowards, as silence is the deafening noise that has been heard throughout this book so far of anyone righteous to speak up against any of the atrocities taking place. The only one getting any media attention is the evil king, and now Haman, his son in the faith of idol worship, who is twice as worthy of hell as the king himself. Because no one has spoken up at this time, those who were supposed to be holy, set apart, and witnesses of the one true God to all the world will now be totally silenced, once and for all, by death. The Jews have lost their chance to speak up. But praise God that Haman trusted in the stars, and the stars said, bring this to fruition in 11 months. It has been said by many men many different ways, but the old adage that if you stop fighting for liberty, you will lose it rings true here again. The scribes record the evil plot and hurry off with a greater expediency than USPS to deliver the mail. The good news, you might say, at least to the ears of the wicked, to those who also love death, who worship materialism, to those who would be excited to have an opportunity to plunder their neighbor's homes to even kill them if they particularly did not like them, legally. When push comes to shove, it is astonishing how many people will jump at the opportunity to kill their own neighbor or their own children and plunder their goods if they can be assured by the law of the land that they will bear no earthly consequences for it. James said it succinctly, what causes quarrels in what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. James leaves the connections very plain for us. There's no room for debate in this letter that the king is sending out. This doesn't need to pass through legislatures or be upheld in courts. The king is the law in this land, and so the law goes out at his decree. The emperor at this point is no longer trying to appear like he has clothes on. He doesn't care anymore that he is in fact naked, morally speaking. He is naked and unashamed of his nakedness because he does not fear the Lord. He has seared his conscience years in at this point to the point where genocide is just a consumer product. If someone is willing to pay him for it, he will complete the job or at least supply the resources for the job because like many fools in power, he aims to keep his hands clean of the dirty work so that he can likely blame it on someone else down the road. There's no question in this letter as to what the emperor is saying. He speaks with abundant clarity. It is sad Quite sad that even Christians, us, we are 
quick at times to question what God's Word really says, and yet trust that the words of men are holy and good, despite being obviously to the contrary. Why is this practice and habit so common in the church today? At the root, it's because the same serpent offering us the same poison lives. And just as the serpent first tempted our mother Eve, we too often give the benefit of the doubt to the serpent instead of the Lord our God. This often comes in the form of holding the rhetoric of evil politicians and their laws up behind evil, or I'm sorry, rose-colored glasses. We hear the questions. We've heard them even in the past few months. Does the Canadian C4 anti-conversion bill really say Christians can't preach the gospel? Does the infanticide bill in CA right now passing through the legislature really allow mothers to kill babies up to seven days after they've been born? Is Roe v. Wade really that bad? When the American medical doctors changed the definition of pregnancy from conception to post-implantation, was it really maleficent? Is it really all that bad to call trans people by their gender delusion instead of what God called them? Is adultery really that destructive? Is being gay really shameful? We were sure the Obergefell decision would not limit freedom of religion, and many took the bait. Why is this happening? It's because we question the word of God and fail to rightly scrutinize the words of men. We are backwards in our presuppositions, and therefore backwards in our methodology, our application, and backwards in our complete conclusions. The Christian testimony is simple in this competition of words, the words of men and the words of God. It is very simple. It is a line in the sand that the apostle draws, and we must assess what side we fall on. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Ephesians 6 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Who is true? The men who say, it's really, I'm not trying to take your freedoms. It's really not going to get that bad. Your conclusions are so logical. I'm going to really sink in a lot of deceptive words to make them seem illogical. But, or do we trust that there really is a cosmic battle taking place? At the root of all battles is a cosmic battle. It's happening right before our very eyes every single day of this life. There is a battle beneath it all. We're just seeing the fruits of it play out in this life. Every last battle of life and death in this grand story of reality traces its roots to the battle of the cosmos between the serpent and the creator. The giver of the king of glory, the giver of life versus the prince of demise, the giver of death. This is not an equal battle. It's not an equal battle. Don't misunderstand the word of God. But it is the most epic of battles, and it is the most real of battles. What we see is the fruits of this foundational battle. And the serpent strikes again in our text today. The emperor is no longer using fine political rhetoric to hide his lust for sin and death. What does he say? Kill. Destroy. Annihilate. All Jews. Kill, destroy, annihilate. This isn't about protection of the king. It's not self-defense, the prosperity of the empire. It's not about the liberty of the citizens. This is what it has been about all along to the serpent. A love of death flowing from a hatred of the author of life. A love of death flowing from a hatred of the author of life. To add to the thickening plot of it all, this edict was drafted and sent out the day before Passover. Verse 12 says it was the 13th day of the first month. 13th day 
of the first month. And Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 6 says, speaking of the Passover, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. End quote. And as a reminder of why the Passover was instituted by God, we learn in Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 28. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through the, and strike to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. End quote. So the edict was drafted and sent out the day before the Passover. The day before one of the most important Jewish holidays and feasts. Remembering that the Lord spared the Israelites from the Egyptians. That he rescued them from slavery and even more specifically through the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. God preserved their very lives. They would live despite the deadly oppression of this ungodly earthly power in the Egyptians. This was an ultimate reversal. Rather than the Israelites die off and lose their posterity, God would provide a sacrifice, and whosoever in faith trusted in that sacrifice, which would practically lead them to kill the lamb and put the blood on their door, would be spared from death. The Israelites would be passed over by the wrath of God. They were to teach this history to their children forever, God said. When the children asked, what do we mean by this service? Generations later, you shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. The Israelites, we see here, were explicitly commanded to indoctrinate their children with the truth. Children, make no mistake, are always being indoctrinated with something. It's just a matter of if it's true or false. The Passover was gospel, of course. This was essential truth. It was the foretaste of the ultimate good news that would come. And the day after celebrating the Passover, the entire Persian Empire begins to get word that the Israelites would not be passed over anymore. Their time had come. The serpent had won. He had used wicked men to do wicked things. What they meant for evil, he, the serpent, also meant for evil. Without giving away too much of the Esther narrative in the weeks to come, let's flash forward to a similar instance in human history. Another time when another edict came out by another evil patriarch and politician that directly called for the death of God's people, and more specifically, children. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. I want you to see some of the cyclical patterns of this great story of God's reality so that you see the ultimate battle of the cosmos taking place. Nothing in history happened by random chance. 
Matthew 2, 1 through 8. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more, End quote. I don't have time to go through all the parallels that are very similar to our story here, and even perhaps more so to the Exodus. But Lord willing, you're beginning to see the underlying war that plays out before our eyes on earth. History is cyclical for a reason. It's not just because we fail to learn from history. No, it's more than that. It is because of an evil king, or so he thinks himself a king, who hates God and leads many astray. He gets pitiful men made of dust to do his dirty work. This life is filled with a near infinitum of realities beyond what we can see with the plain eye. Even now, the amount of waves going through this room to our cell phones with real information that we cannot see is actually unbelievable. We see the tiniest sliver of the light and subsequent color spectrum. We trip even when we can see the path before our eyes. And yet we doubt the God who created all things when he so plainly tells us that there is a cosmic war beneath the earthly war. A cosmic war directing the earthly war. And to be honest, with mustard seed sized faith, you can see the cosmic war playing out. You can see the darkness behind so many motives and decisions in this life. But you can also see the unfolding and unstoppable redemption of God. Herod was another pawn like Haman, another evil king like Ahasuerus, who loved death, power, and wealth. The patriarchy persists throughout all generations, but most often it has been evil. Evil. Here we have Haman the Agagite, and later in history we have Herod and his fatherhood dating back multiple generations, which was arguably even more evil than him. Evil edicts from evil men that beget death. The parallels to our story in Esther, though, do not stop at the birth of Christ. The devil failed to kill the Christ at birth. As we will see in the story, he will fail to stop the seed of the Christ in the Israelites in the Persian Empire. Eventually, the serpent would succeed, though. The serpent would succeed in his endeavor. If he could not stop the seed of the Christ, 
that once he was there in the flesh, his goal was singular, kill the Christ. In Esther, the serpent's scheme was to crush the seed that the Christ would come from, and he used Haman to bring about this abolishment of the messianic seed. In the Gospels, we learn the serpent used Herod and many other evil men to, in fact, kill the Messiah present before them. Because he, the serpent, of course, had failed in all of his previous attempts. Luke 23, 32 through 43. I know I'm reading a lot of scripture today, but I want you to see history cycling through, playing out before our eyes, that you see the same sins of men and the same redemption of God, that you might trust in God no matter what you see in our day. This is from Luke. 23, 32 through 43. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide the garments. And the people stood by, watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, The soldiers also mocked, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, "Do Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly. For we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 13 of our text says, everyone is to kill, destroy, and annihilate all the Jews and plunder their goods. How did they arrive at this conclusion? According to last week's text, they cast lots. Casting lots as to when this should all happen. Haman trusted in the stars to tell him when to bring about his evil plans instead of trusting in the God who made all the stars and, as the Bible says, even named every last one of them. The people of God throughout the Persian Empire actually did deserve death. They deserved death dating all the way back to the garden. Yet God killed an animal and clothed Adam and Eve in the skins of the animal in Genesis chapter 3. The people of God deserved death at the flood, but God provided salvation in the bark. Death at the exodus, but God provided salvation in the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. In a mighty deliverance out of Egypt entirely, they deserved death in the wandering. But God provided manna from heaven and salvation from the death of the serpent stinging them. That if they would just simply believe upon the bronze serpent that Moses held up, the curse of the sting flowing through their veins, soon to kill them would be reversed and they would live. They deserved death under Babylon, but God preserved them through the Persian takeover. And here they still deserve death for their sins against God. The Persians have no right to kill them, make no mistake. Not at all. But God does. If you've been with us at Bible study, you will know the spiritual state of the people of God across the empire, still within it, but across it, even among those who did return to Jerusalem. The spiritual state is one of very lifeless and dry bones. The book of Malachi, the final book in the Old Testament, again taking place around the same time as Esther, it begins with God saying, I have loved you. And the people of God respond to God by saying, how have you loved us? After hundreds, even thousands of years of God's loving deliverance, mercy, provision, and promises, they are so blind and have so exchanged the truth of God for a lie that they can't even name one way in which God has loved them. There wasn't one righteous, no, not even one. The Jews, according to Haman's plans, were destined to die and have their goods plundered according to the casting of their lots. Without going in depth just yet into the further plot line of Esther, we know they are preserved. The plan gets reversed and the curse gets rolled back. Why? Why? How? 
How do they survive this? On what basis does God save his people yet again? Why does he spare them the piercing, the shame, the plundering? Why has he spared you? Why is he sparing our children? Why is he sparing anyone on this earth? Because for our sake... God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Israelites were spared because roughly 500 years later, Jesus Christ was crucified. Jesus was crucified and his goods were plundered according to the casting of lots. He was pierced for their transgressions and the chastisement of the world was put on him. He bore the shame of his people. He was beaten, betrayed, and innocently innocently slaughtered. He alone was the only innocent man to ever live, the only one truly deserving of life forevermore, and yet he was crucified. The serpent succeeded at last, or so it seemed, in his foolish endeavor to kill the Son of God, to preserve himself from being crushed under the foot of the woman. The final verse of our text shows the the united friendship and evil that the king and Haman have, united in their rebellion against God. Verse 15 of our text in Esther says, The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Different motives, we've learned, they had, Haman and the king, Different schools of thought, perhaps, but the same spiritually corrupt motive to rebel against their maker leads them to ominously sit and drink after agreeing upon genocide as if it was just another night in paradise. And so it was for Herod and Pilate. Once enemies... Now friends, united against the Christ, against God, against the true King and true Lord of all. As you see in the crucifixion narrative in Luke 23, verse 12, it says, And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with one another. Different motives, different schools of thought, but united in their hatred of God. Do you see the cosmic war, dear church? Ultimately, evil will always divide, but when it comes to uniting against the Lord who rules the nations with a rod of iron, many fools will come out to unite in that hopeless endeavor at stopping him. The serpent did succeed in killing the Son of God. He did. But we know from the scriptures that even he was really just a pawn in the hands of the true king. He was just a yappy dog on a leash. We know what he meant for evil in the people he used meant for evil, God meant for good, for very good. Acts chapter 4, verse 27 and 28, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place, end quote. The whole story of reality is really the tale of two kings. The story of Esther is a microcosm of the whole. It, too, is a story of two kings, one sovereign, wise, merciful, loving, priestly, prophetic, and eternal. The other, dust, hateful, malicious, blind, and currently, right now, and forever on, dead. We see not only some of the parallels of large moments in human history in our text today, but we also see the complete contrast of these two kings. Whereas one sends forth a bribery-induced, cowardly letter of death, God sends forth his letter, his word, proclaiming life. Ahasuerus' letter is now only preserved and remembered because it is referenced in the eternal word of God. One letter sent forth death in all languages to all the people in the empire— And the other that declares that death has been conquered by God himself 
by sending his only begotten son to die in the place of those who deserve death. And God is bringing this letter of salvation to all languages around the world. This is the tale of two kings. And make no mistake, church, there is only one man worthy of worship in all the cosmos. You will inevitably worship. Everyone is a worshiper. Foundationally, there is no non-religious person. They might not attend a particular church, but I assure you, they give of their money to certain things. They sing certain songs that reveal their worldview And you can see the gods they worship. God says, look at their checkbooks, and there you'll see their heart. You can see right into it. It's actually a bit of a fallacy that man can't see the heart of man. God says, just look at their money. And you'll see what they love, what they cherish, truly. Everyone is a worshiper. Most just worship what they see in the mirror. But there is only one worthy of worship, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is worthy of your very life. Paul says it's saintly to live as Christ and to die as gain. You must worship him, yes, you must. It's not that there's actually another option. Everyone must worship him. Everyone will eventually bow their knee to him. But if you see him rightly... If you've seen some of the parallels of this story so far and what I have gone through, if you're seeing him rightly, you will desire nothing else but him. You'll desire to worship no one else but him, a mighty savior, a redeemer of those who were once his enemies, sets his love upon even them, upon us. Contrast the word of our text, this letter from the king and Haman, Contrast it with Romans 10, 5 through 17, which says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near to you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. Hear this. Bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. End quote. Very different letters coming from very different kings. And whereas the king and Haman sit and drink... At the end of our text, as six months of drunkenness was apparently not enough, focusing every effort of their lives on self-preservation, while one of the darkest letters of genocide in human history goes out to really all the world at this time, the Bible tells us that our Lord is waiting to drink of the vine until we recline at table with him. He is remaining vigilant, living always to mediate for us, the author of Hebrews says. Whereas Haman and King Ahasuerus drink to resist the Spirit of God and forget their sinful miseries and treachery, God tells us, the church, to remain sober and even instituted for us a meal with the vine that we are to do often in remembrance of him being broken and killed for us, in remembrance of his blood, the blood of the Lamb, being shed for us so that the wrath of God may pass over us. Matthew 26, 26 through 29 Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Do not doubt the words of God, church. Doubt the words of men. Doubt even your own doubting thoughts. But do not doubt the words of God. We are all in this grand story of reality, and like the best of authors, our God has embedded details, parallels, plot twists, conflicts, and ultimate redemption in this story that we will unpack for an eternity. The story will get better and better and better the more times you read it. Let us be a people who plumb the depths of God's word, seeing and savoring the many glorious details within the story, seeing the way in which God has revealed his nature through the creation, yet more importantly has revealed his ultimate redemption of all of his people in his word that he has sent forth to us. The gospel did not originate in English. He had it translated to you. Compare and contrast the two kings One sends a letter of death and the other a letter of life. There is only one worthy of your praise and adoration and your trust, dear church. Trust in the king. Trust in the king, the true king. And fear not, little flock. Just like the Israelites should not have feared the king's edict, but rather trusted in the one true king, their great deliverer, their great redeemer, so must we now and always do the same. Romans 8, 28 through 32 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that in light of one of the darkest portions of your scripture, we see your redemption. Perhaps even better, when we hold up your letters and your kingly rule, your love for us, despite our sin, to the black, dark, deadly backdrop of the plot of Haman the Agagite and King Ahasuerus, we see most clearly that there is only one king over all the land. Only one king worthy of adoration and love. Only one king worthy of following Help us, Lord, to take you at your word, to worship you rightly, to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor, which first and foremost is our spouse, our children, our roommates, this church, and the lost here in this very city and county and state. You are savoring a number as numerous as the sand of the sea. You've made that plain throughout all of history. Let us take you at your word and fight on and pray on, trusting that you are the good king and the end is sure. It ends all in victory because the serpent is underfoot because your son died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, was buried and risen on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. To his glory, in his name, amen.